Did y'all notice I was a little lost up there in the front row? I went back and I got the microphone and I didn't put it on back there, so I'm trying to put it on up here and my wife is not here and so I'm really lost. Um, my wife is home with Lydia, um, so just pray for her. She's got some things going on. We don't know the answers yet, but uh, just be praying that God gives wisdom to the doctors and we get it figured out. So, but uh, we were not fighting. That's why she. That's not why she's not here. So, we're all good. So you know, take your Bibles. Turn to Philippians chapter four. We're going to finish up our brief study. I don't know if I can use the word brief. It was kind of our New Year's resolution, but it should be a life resolution that's taken us several weeks to get through. So we're going to finish our brief break from Colossians. Lord willing, we'll be back in Colossians next Sunday. Um, also, I have been asked, are we having service? Are we watching football tonight? Um, we will be here for service. You make the decision on if you're going to be there, if you're going to watch the game. So, um, it's kind of ironic that tonight is red night for Awana. Anybody else find that ironic? I think our Awana director wants the Chiefs to win, but I don't know if I could make that argument. But I found that ironic. Well, um, I'd like to review, we're going to start in Philippians 4, begin, re- begin reading in verse 1. He says there, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Iodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful this morning to come to your word. And Lord God, I pray that our hearts would be ready and receptive to receive what you want us to learn from the scripture. And Father, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought and clarity of mind. Lord, I pray, I beg you to use the feeble things that I attempt to say. I pray, Lord, that you would use them for your glory and for your praise. Father, you know our hearts. We do not want to be a church that simply comes and says, we've done our duty, we're done, we're going to go home. But God, we want to come to church. We want to hear the word of God. Our desire is to become conformed to the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that we not only hear, but God, I pray that we, we, we would be listeners. I pray that we'd be expositional hearers, that hear the Word of God, and we want to apply it to our lives. And Lord, if there's any here who've never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I pray that the Gospel would go forth. I pray that they'd hear the truth of the Word. And I pray they'd come to understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Lord, I ask that you would use this time for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Let me remind you quickly of where we begin in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Remember, Paul shared his love for the church. He says, I, I love the church. I care for the church. And he says, I care for them. But then he gives them a challenge. Now remember, the, the Philippians was written to the church at Philippi. And he writes, and he says, Church, you need to stand firm. He gives them this command. 
It's in the imperative mood. He doesn't say if you feel like it. He says if you're, gonna, if you're going to stand firm, that's what he calls them to do in verse 1. He says stand firm in the Lord. And then verses 2 through 9, he expounds. And he says if you're going to stand firm in the Lord, here are the steps that you need to take. And my challenge to myself is the same challenge I would give to you. If we're going to stand firm in a world that is falling apart, we must apply these things so that we will stand firm in the Lord. Because if you've not noticed, our world is, continues to fall apart. But that's biblical. Don't freak out about it. It's okay. Because God's got the whole world in his hands. He knows what he's doing. And then in verses 2 and 3, he says, you need to live in harmony you need to get along. we got to be on guard against personal preferences. That can creep in the door, can't it? Maybe just me. <laughs> if I'm the only one that has personal pre pre uh, preference, praise God, then we'll do whatever I want. So I don't want to hear you say, Jake, why are we doing that? Because y'all said you don't. I'm just kidding. We have personal preference, don't we? And it can be little things. Maybe we want donuts in Sunday school. And other people say, no, we don't. I'm on a diet. <laughs> We've got to be on guard. We've got to work to live in harmony with each, uh, each other. Verse 4 is very easy. Yeah, right. He says, if you're going to stand firm in the Lord, you need to rejoice in the Lord. He doesn't say when it's convenient, when it feels good. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. We need to have a, an attitude of, of being joyful. That's hard, isn't it? Okay, just me again, all right. It's hard to rejoice in the Lord always. We've got bodies that are frail. I don't think it's fair. I'm 35 and my body seems to be falling apart. But y'all tell me, just wait till you're my age. And I'm like, no, no, please no. Lord, take me home before that or come quickly. But he says rejoice in the Lord always. And that's hard when it's difficult, isn't it? He goes on and he says, we need to... We need to put, uh, put on an attitude of prayer. and We need to act in prayer. We need to put off worry. And, and I could spend all of our time just reviewing, and I don't want to do that. But each one of those things, if we are going to stand firm in the Lord, folks, we must be doing every one of those things. And if you're not, we need to identify, or you need to identify, why not? What needs is to change or, in order for me to stand firm? This morning... I plan to bring our study to a conclusion when we look at verses 8 and 9. We're going to see that if we're going to stand firm as followers of Christ, we're going to demonstrate first godly thinking, and secondly, we'll demonstrate godly living. And I would say that in verses 8 and 9, this is really the, the climax of this section. But prior to, to looking at those verses, I want us to take a step back. And I want us to look at a couple of passages in hopes that we might understand or be reminded of the power of the mind. Let's start in Romans chapter 1. Very familiar passage to many, but in chapter 1, we'll look at verse 24. If we had time, I would start in verse 18, where he basically says, everybody knows that there's a God, and every person is without excuse. And in verse 24, he says, therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their Women exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the women and burned in their desire toward one another. And with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. It says God gave them over, right? Yes. 
is the answer. God gave them over. Colossians, it's been so long since we've been there, but I promise we're going to go back. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, look at, look at what Paul says. In verse 21, he says, And although you were formerly, formerly alienated and hostile, here it is, in mind, engaged in evil deeds. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians four four. In verse three, Paul writes and he says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Did you hear it? It says, blinded the minds. Last one, and I'll let you take a break for a minute. No, not a minute, for a second. Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, we look at verse one and he says and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest my point in looking at those verses is I just want to, you to make note of the point that the, prior to coming to Christ with our minds, our intellect, we were against the cross, right? Yes? 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. The mind is powerful. Our minds affect our conduct. Now listen to these verses. You guys okay to turn to a couple more? Okay, you didn't agree, so <laughs> go for it. Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22. And I want us to look at verse 37. We can start at 34. I, I trust you're very familiar with this section of Scripture. But in verse 34, it says, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Notice he says, with all your mind. Just listen to this in 1 Peter chapter 1. Very, maybe a familiar verse to you. But, but I find this interesting. When Peter wrote 1 Peter, he was writing to believers that were enduring immense persecution. And when we say immense persecution, there was an individual ruling. You guys familiar with Nero? Nero would take Christians and he would uh, line his driveway with Christians and he would light them on fire. That's how he would light his driveway, or his pathway. And Peter writes, and he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, this blows my mind. And maybe we experience a little bit of suffering, but I've not heard that we've been used to light someone's driveway yet. 
But Peter writes and he tells them in verse 13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, prepare your minds. Get ready to act. I'm not much of a computer guru. I know enough to be dangerous. But my understanding is there's an acronym called G-I-G-O. Is that right? Okay. Garbage in, garbage out. What goes into your mind, or what goes into our minds, will affect our conduct. Our minds affect everything that we do. Let me tell you a, a couple of illustrations. I have a good friend of mine. We did lots of stuff together. Some of it was good. Some of it might have been a little risky. But I had a friend, and uh, we were in youth group together. We did a lot of fun stuff. We'd go door to door together, and we would knock on doors, and people would open the door, and some would be receptive, most of them would not be receptive, and one person was telling us, they said, um, well actually, so I was in charge of the door-to-door -door evangelism, but I couldn't drive the church van. And so I'd have somebody come in who would drive, and then there would be 15 of us, and we would start knocking on doors. Well, we were in South Lake, Texas, um, nice neighborhood. And then you got me in high school, and I'm supposed to be in charge of this group. And uh, so we go, and we just split up, and we'd get out in you know, groups of two or three, and we'd just go start knocking on doors, and we would, we'd go right in to sharing the gospel. And um, my friend, he and I are similar, which is probably not a good thing, but he went out to a door, and bam, 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 and <clears throat> this high school girl opened the door. And she started saying... He said, okay, well, what are you going to do when you die and you stand before God? And uh, she said, well, it's all based on how you live your life. And, and my friend goes, nope, you're on your way to hell. He was right. He was right, but that was a little abrupt, especially because we didn't know this individual. Well, dad comes. And uh, it, it was interesting to say the least. He asked who's in charge. Well, <laughs> me... And um, he was not satisfied with that, and so then he let the driver know, and I don't know if that person drove any more for me, um, but he loved God. I was interning in Delta in 2003, and my friend called me. He said, Jake, can I come see? I said, absolutely. So he came out, and we, uh, this was before the accident, and so I would hike, and I would enjoyed it. Then we hiked up behind this, um, this park in Greeley, and um, we got to the top of it, and he said, Jake, I'm going to kill myself. Whoa. Wow. Never saw that coming. And we talked, and we talked up on top of that mountain, and I took him to Scripture, and I quoted as many verses as I could, and I shared with him, and by God's grace... He's in Arizona serving the Lord. But the power of the mind, he allowed these things into his mind where he felt like he it was of no value. And his life was worthless. And we went through Scripture and I said, man, God created you in His image. I said, you're really going to kill yourself and you're going to just throw yourself back to God and say, God, I don't like what you gave me. The power of the mind. I had another friend of mine who uh, is in Oregon, and he was diagnosed with a severe heart defect. And he was young, and he struggled and struggled. And one day, somebody told me, and I picked up the phone, and I said, Cody, are you okay? And he was not. And that was minutes before he was going to take his life. He called me last month, and he said, Jake, I just want to, you to know how big of a part you played in my life because I was going to end it that day. And I don't want credit, but that's the power of the mind. The power of the mind. We can maybe get more practical. 
maybe when we struggle with anger, the power of the mind can really affect us. Worrying, lustful thoughts, selfish thoughts. Paul brings this section to conclusion in verse 8 and 9, and he says in verse 8, the ESV version says it like this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. He uses that word, finally, the rest of, the remaining. Paul is bringing this section to a conclusion and he uses that word brothers or brother and he says, fellow believer, those who are partakers of the grace that God freely gives, listen up. Listen up. And then he uses this word whatever. Whatever. I hear that word on a regular basis from my kids. Whatever, Dad. Whatever, Dad. But this word is used six times among 20 words. The idea of it is to the degree that I'm not going to go through every one of these well, I will quickly, Lord willing. But he, he starts off, and Paul gives this challenge, and he tells the church, he says, believers, you have got to think godly. Folks, if we're going to stand firm, we've got to think godly. Because you can go anywhere in, the, in America, you can go to any church and find a church to teach which we want to hear. Is that true? Yeah, we can. It's out there. But we've got to be biblical. We've got to think godly. Paul provides us with these six virtues. He says the first one is whatever is true. In other words, whatever is real, whatever is honest, the things that correspond to the teaching of God's word, that's what you need to be thinking on. And so in order for us to think on things, that are true, if it, if it pertains to that which corresponds to God's Word, then we need to be in the Word of God. We need to read the Word of God. Not this idea of a chapter a day keeps the devil away. We need to immerse ourselves in the Word of God to know what it says so that we can think godly. Makes me think of verses like John 17, 17. I sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. Psalm 19.9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Psalm 119, 151, he says, But you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. If all, you, all of his commandments are true, we've got to know what his commandments are. If we're going to know what they are, then we've got to immerse ourselves in the word of God. Sleeping on your Bible is not going to make you more godly, I promise. You've got to work at it. The point that Paul is making is, is that to the degree that it is real and honest, then you, church at Philippi, should think on these things. That's what you've got to be dwelling on. Church, he's saying, church at Philippi, don't focus on the Judaizers, the false teachers who've come in, who are teaching false doctrine, saying that you've got to abide by the Jewish law. Paul says, if you're going to stand firm, do all of these things. But he says, let me just remind you, think godly. Think godly. I find it ironic. I might get myself in trouble for doing this. I don't have it, so you don't have to worry. It's right there. Did y'all see the paper this week? I don't know if that was the paper or exactly what it is, but did you see an article that was disturbing? Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to it. I'm going to be on it. 
There was an article about a Bible study that's going to be started in Cedar Edge, I guess over Zoom is what I've seen, and it's by a, a local church that is they're going to explain why the Bible accepts um, the, and I'm sorry, I can't remember it, but accepts the LGB, yeah. So I'm going to see if I can attend that. And they want to go to passages of Scripture because they say that we have not interpreted them correctly because it does teach that we are to accept that movement. Sad, isn't it? But we need to think on things that are truth. We need to think on the Word of God. A couple other verses I'll just read for you in Isaiah 65, 16. It says, So that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth. Ephesians 4.21 But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. Paul tells us that we must think on things that are true. That is, we know that the Word of God is truth, right? We know that the Word of God is truth. It is reliable. We know that God is a God of truth. That is what we need to be dwelling on. And he goes on in verse 8. He says, whatever is true. And then he says, whatever is honorable. That that which is worthy of respect. Respect. I ask the question, what and who is ultimately worthy of respect? We might come up with people's names and things like that. But I would say that the person who is ultimately worthy of respect is God alone. That is what we need to be thinking on. And we're going to fly through these next ones. Then he says, that which is right or that which is um, pure that which is innocent, that which is holy, that which is lovely or commendable, as the ESV version says. Lovely, that which is pleasing and gracious, agreeable. And then he says, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. If there's anything worthy of praise, if there's anything worthy of commendation, you're to think about these things. You see, Paul doesn't just say, hey, church, if you feel like thinking godly, do it. This is a command. He says, dwell on these things. He doesn't say when you feel like it, when you're feeling good, when your health is good. It's hard, isn't it? When our health isn't good. It's hard, isn't it? Maybe. Okay. For me, it's hard. For my little girl, it's hard. My little, you know, my little girl told me last night, don't you dare tell her I said this. <laughs> but she told me last night, she goes, Daddy, I prayed and asked God to take my pain away. And he didn't. So her and I are going to talk this afternoon. That's hard, isn't it? When you see maybe you're in pain or someone you love is in pain or you see a child in pain. But if we're going to stand firm, we have to think godly. But we're not going to just automatically think godly Paul's been building up to this climax, hasn't he? He says, you've got to stand firm in the Lord. And then he goes through and he says, hey, here's all the things you need to do. You need to live in harmony. You need to rejoice. You need to leave with contentment with all people. Get rid of worrying. And, and you need to pray and have an attitude of prayer and act on prayer. And these, all these things. And then he says, oh, now as you're doing those things, you've got to think godly. We could ask questions. Well, how are we doing? Are we anxious? Are we worried? 
Are you and I rejoicing in the Lord always? Are you in harmony with fellow believers? Folks, we, we live in a world where so-called Christians are being divorced. They have failing marriages. Divorces is running rampant, isn't it? We have the push to accept homosexuality. We have the influence of pornography and child abuse and, and sexting and whatever else there may be, but this is all prevalent in the world. And it can be hard to stand firm in the Lord. But if we're going to stand firm, then we have got to do everything we can to think godly. And we do that by immersing ourselves in the Word of God. And that list goes on, doesn't it? Be in the Word of God. Memorize God's Word. Meditate on God's Word. All of those things. Be committed to the spiritual disciplines. I believe that's why Paul told Timothy, he says, Timothy, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Godliness doesn't just come by going, mm, okay, I got it memorized. No. You got to get up early. You got to stay up late. You got to carve out time. You got to be in the word of God to learn it. It doesn't just happen. You've got to work hard. I read an article last night, and, and I, maybe I didn't read far enough in it, but I, I found it interesting. It says, the average stay for somebody in the ministry as a youth pastor is three years, and the average for a senior pastor is four years. I sure hope that's not the case here. I hope I don't get kicked out at four years, but we'll see. But I, the article went on, and, and I haven't yet been able to comprehend it, but it said in, within the past couple of years, they said they did a survey that showed that 1,700 pastors quit every month. I think that's high, but maybe I'm missing something. That just blew my mind. But we live in a world that is falling apart. It's broken. But if you and I are going to stand firm, we've got to think godly. That's why the psalmist says, we can go to Psalm 119. We're going to go to a lot of verses really fast. We're going to be in one chapter, though. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? But by how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Verse 11. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. Verse 24, your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. Verse 27, make me understand the way of your precepts so I will meditate on your wonders. Verse 29, remove the false way from me and graciously grant me your law. 31, I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Do not put me to shame. 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. 35, make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Now you're going to have to turn to page 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. We can stop there. Otherwise, I'm going to read the whole psalm. We've got to think on the 
Word of God. We all know we need to do that, don't we? Is it hard? Some people are like, yeah, no. Second Corinthians chapter 10, I'll just read it in verse 4. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Ephesians 6 talks about a spiritual battle. If we're going to stand firm, we've got to control our minds. The things that we allow into our minds are going to affect our actions, aren't they? When I was a youth pastor, I had a lot of teens ask me, they said, well, I can watch any movies. My parents have no standard for me. And I said, okay. <clears throat> and we went on and they talked and they talked. And I said, listen, I said, I'm not going to tell you what to watch and what not, not to watch. I said, I'm going to tell you what you watch is going to affect your life. I promise you. No, it's not. No, it's not. I said, you watch. You mark my word. Years later, yeah, you were right. And I took in the Philippians 4.8, I said, you've got to think on things that honor God. You've got to think on things that are honoring to Him. We've got to control our minds. We've got to control the things that we think on. Because when we start worrying, what happens? We let our mind kind of get out of control, don't we? Our mind kind of gets out of control and we start worrying about our kids or worrying about life or finances or job or family or whatever it is, grandkids. We start panicking. And then we got to kind of bring our minds back into check, right? We've got to fix our minds on, or fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We've got to think on things that bring honor to God. Now we're going to see what godly thinking does. I love verse 9. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. He says, Paul says, The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is great. I love this. Paul says, what you've learned, he says, what, what you've been taught, what I've been teaching you, what I've been writing to you, what I've been telling you, he goes, you've received it. You've you said, okay, yeah, I want to hear it. Bring it on. And so the church has listened, and then he says, okay, you've heard it. You've literally heard it with your ears. He goes, and, I, and this is, I love this word. And what does he say? Seen. In me. Paul didn't just say, here, this is what you need to do, but he's living it. He's living it out, and that's the mo I believe that's the most effective type of evangelism, right? Is if you live a transformed life, people are like, why are you joyful today? Did you hear what was just saying? Well, yeah, but my God's still good. Paul didn't just say, here's all the things you need to do. They have seen that in his life. What an encouragement this must have been to the church at Philippi. Paul didn't just say, come in and say, do as I say, not as I do. He says, I taught you the truth. You heard the truth. You accepted the truth. And then he said, you witnessed the truth in my life. And then he says, he said, you saw it in me. Then he tells them, practice these things. Practice. Imperative command, you go and do this. That's why the Bible is so clear about the fruit that will be seen in a believer's life. In Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7 in verse 15. Jesus writes and, and he says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. 
you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Paul says you've got to think godly. But then he says now you need to act. You need to see these things played out in your life. He's not teaching a works-based salvation, is he? No, he's not. Just you know, he's not. He's talking to believers, the church at Philippi. They know Christ, and so he writes and he says, "Look, you need to stand firm in the Lord. Here are the steps you're going to take in order to stand firm." And then he ends this this uh, the climax, I believe, of this section. He goes, "You got to think godly." And now he says, "Now go and do it. Now let it be seen in every area of your life." Practice these things. He ends verse 9. He tells us what the benefit is. He goes, now practice these things, and here's the benefit. And the God of peace will be with you. As we dwell on godly things, that leads to godly living. And as you do these things, the benefit is, this is bonus material, the God of peace is with me. That's awesome. One commentator says this, believers, he says, quote, believers must be disciplined to add to their faith the proper attitudes, thoughts, and actions described in this passage. Only then will they develop spiritual stability in their lives. End quote. That's amazing. So what? Let's give you a couple questions to consider. One, what do you enjoy dwelling on the most? We all know the right answer. We're in church for crying out loud. But be honest with yourself. What do you enjoy dwelling on the most? We know we should say God. We know we should say the Word of God. But be honest between you and God. Another way maybe to ask the same question would be, what do you spend your time doing? I've heard people say, well, Jake, I I just don't have time to read my Bible. I said, well, great. I have a really neat chart that I'm going to give you. And it has you mark out every 10 minutes what you're doing every day for 24 hours. I want you to fill that out for one week and then come back and meet with me. They don't come back. But what do you, what do you dwell on the most? I guess I'll let you fill in the blank. I think it's easy to, to let our minds dwell on things that we know that are, we kind of get overwhelmed with, right? Could be health. It could be kids, grandkids. It could be extended family. It could be churches. It could be what churches are, how churches are responding with all that's going on. It could be what's happening to our country. It could be, it could be, it could be. But I would ask, are you spending the same amount of time in the Word of God? And then once you determine what you're dwelling on the most, follow that up with, is that honoring or dishonoring to the Lord? And then you can follow that up with, what do you want to dwell on? If you say, I want to dwell on God, praise God. But remember, that requires work. That requires discipline. That's why you hear the word like spiritual disciplines. Because a chapter a day does not keep the devil away. You've got to be in the word. Not just reading to read, but reading to be transformed. And to learn what God wants us to do. And if you're here and you do not know 
Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. James chapter 4 brings things into perspective. This passage of Scripture sometimes I don't care, I don't care for. Especially when I wasn't ready to surrender my life to Christ. But he says in James chapter 4, verse 13, he says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Here's the phrase that I want you to make note of. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Your life and my life is a vapor. Every breath that we take is a gift from God. And if you have not settled your eternal destiny in your heart, if you're saying, you know what, Jake, I I don't believe it. I don't believe in God. Then I would encourage you to, to, to search the Word of God. Get the answers. And I would beg you, I would plead with you to be reconciled, made right with God right now. Because we all will walk out this door. Some will get in cars and go home. Some will walk home like me. But you don't know if you'll get in a car wreck. You don't know when the Lord is going to take you home. But if you don't know Christ, the Bible is crystal clear that if you, if you die apart from Christ, that you will awake to everlasting contempt. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. In a place called hell. Hell is a reality. And if you don't know Christ, I pray that you would come to understand that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of our sin, we deserve to die and go to hell. But God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we are yes sinners, Christ died for us. He made a way for us. That's an amazing God, isn't it? Yes, it is an amazing God. It's a God. It's the God of the Bible. It is the only God. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to Father except through me. So if you don't know Christ, let me plead with you. Realize your brokenness. Realize your frailty. Realize that there is one God. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Romans is crystal clear that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In Matthew chapter 3, you have the ministry of John the Baptist. And in the ministry of John the Baptist, he kind of gives us a mini biography of his life about who he was, that he was a messenger. He came and he was, uh, was preaching the message. But you know what his message was? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then if you follow on in Matthew chapter 3, you see that you have two different responses. You have the response of people who were coming and they were hearing and they were confessing their sins saying, yes, I I believe in Jesus. And they followed and they were baptized. And then you had the response of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came and they said, yeah, John, we want to be baptized. And you know what John said? You brood of vipers. You're playing the game. You don't truly believe in Jesus. But I pray that if you don't know Christ, that you will repent. That is, you will have a change of mind. You will turn from your sin. You will embrace the death, burial, burial, resurrection of Christ. And if you don't know Christ, talk to somebody around you. Talk to me. Talk to anybody in this room. Because your life is a vapor. I just lost my place, sorry. I got off on one of my many passions. Let's go ahead and pray, and then Buddy will come lead a song, and then after that I'll come back and we'll prepare for to partake of the Lord's table together. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you're a good God. Father, I am most thankful, Lord Jesus, that the promise of your word says that your word will not return void. God, every time I get the joy to open the word of God, to share the things that are on my heart that I am learning, or that I get to share with the Sunday school class, or I get to share here, there, God, my words are so inadequate, but your promise that your word will not return void, I take great confidence in that. 
And I pray, Jesus, that you would use the feeble things that were said this morning to accomplish your will for your glory, for your praise. God, I pray for those who know Christ that that we would not simply just say, okay, great, and we leave. But Father, I pray that we would truly, myself, would evaluate my life and determine what exactly do I spend my time thinking about. Are they things that bring honor to my God, to our God? Father, I pray that we not simply be hearers, but God, may we apply these things to our life. And Father, if there's one here who's never placed their faith in Jesus, I pray that you would break them. Reveal to them their sin and their need of a Savior. May they come to understand that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We pray all these things in your Son's precious and holy name. Amen.